Good morning, viewers. It's a new day. Welcome to today's devotion with the Daily Fountain, the devotional guide of the Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion. Invite your family and friends. Get your Bible and your Daily Fountain manual while our devotional leader takes us on today's devotion. Hello, viewers. Good morning. And welcome to today's devotional. Of course, as you well know, we're using the Daily Fountain of the Church of Nigeria. Today is uh, Friday, the 26th of January, 2018. And uh, our topic is pure Christianity. The passage this morning is Galatians chapter 2 from verse 1. And then we do it till we get to verse 10. Um, let me read it. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in, who came in by stilt to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man, but those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who walked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also walked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Now this morning we will highlight uh, two verses for our meditation. The first is verse 7. Uh, the gospel for the uncircumcised was committed to Paul, as he said. Paul talked about elsewhere, he talked about the circumcision of the spirit, not just the circumcision of the flesh. Men whose hearts have been circumcised. I know that today we are living in a generation where the world is flowing so much into the church that we are not finding it easy to make a distinction between what should be purely Christian and what shouldn't be. Circumcision entails the cutting off of the false skin. And uh, child of God, it may be important to ask you uh, if the false skin of the world system has been cut off from you. Are you so attached to the world system, having believed in Jesus? Are you still so desperately holding on to the things of the world? You will remember clearly that John, uh, the, the beloved, did say to us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 15, and maybe I should refer to that since we're talking about the circumcision uh, of the heart. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 15, John said to us, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The way I look at it is like <laughs> heaven has the yardstick of measuring whether a man loves God or not. It's as if no matter how much you're shouting, say, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you. <laughs> Before heaven will believe you. It's like, let's check, let's check again. Can we find the love of the world in his heart? Once that is there, <laughs> you are a suspect. Uh, you cannot easily be believed to love God when you love the world. That has to be very, very critical for every child of God. And so when you're talking about the circumcision of the heart, I would encourage that you put that into 
perspective into consideration. The second thing we discover from what Paul was saying in Galatians 2 is the fact that a gospel was committed to him. I like to say that uh, the gospel has been committed to us. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has been committed to us for us to preach it, for us to leave it first actually and then preach it. Uh, hey, what is the gospel? Because it's just, it's not, many times we just say, well, the gospel has been committed to us, but many people don't really, some people, let me put it that way, don't know what the gospel, authentic gospel uh, is. Uh, sometimes I like to take brethren for, uh, like in the church, sometimes we close down service and then we go for, um, neighborhood evangelism where we pair up two two and just move into the neighborhood you know each time I'm, uh, we go out and i'm paired with someone uh they will just naturally expect that you know uh, the pastor will preach i don't like to do that i like to hear what my parishioners are preaching i like to hear what they are saying somebody comes in and he wants to you know witness to somebody and he, and he says which church do you attend he say uh, x y you know z church and they say no 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 that that is a dead church why don't you attend a living church by the way there's no dead church there can only be a dead pulpit the day the pulpit comes alive the pew comes alive you know but that's not the gospel you say oh you you you, you lie you will go to hell you you fornicate you will go to hell of course a sinner must sin what is the gospel what is the gospel what is the content of a gospel message that the apostles preached. Of course, the gospel is the fact that we are sinners and cannot help ourselves, but for that reason, Jesus came in the form of a man. He became man and then lived among us. John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory, we beheld his glory as of the glory of the, uh, the, the begotten Son of God. And so that's the gospel. Jesus came, lived among us, died for us, and then he was resurrected. He rose again. I like to say that any preaching of the gospel that does not put these ones, these factors into consideration, that does not entail the sacrificial death of Jesus, and his resurrection, and the fact that if someone now puts his faith in that atoning death, he is saved. That, that man has not preached the gospel. So you need to check whether you have a proper understanding of what the gospel message is. We need to preach the gospel in season and out of season, like Paul said to Timothy. And I dare say, friends, that that is the only reason why we're left here to be witnesses for Christ. I know that uh, we live in a generation that runs after power, and runs after miracles. Good as they may be, I like to say that the purpose why Jesus left us here is so that we will introduce others to him. We will introduce him to the world. We will bring others into the saving relationship with Christ as we share the gospel. The day you gave your life to Christ, if you have, um, if you died that day, you would have gone to heaven. But God left you here. Why did he leave you here? It's not to just to make money. It's not to, in fact, if you're working in an office, you should see that as the pulpit to preach the gospel. Paul said, I have a gospel to preach. The gospel was committed to him, but not just him, but committed to us. Every one of us that have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, the gospel has been committed to us. You will hear uh, 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 Paul uh, saying that and then you move back as if that was for Paul and not for us. No, that is entirely for us. And i like us to return again back to the, the, the basic component of the gospel preaching, the content of the gospel. Uh, remember, the gospel has to do with Jesus Christ. In fact, if you look at the apostles all through their ministry here, if you read Acts of the Apostles, you will often hear them say, the Bible will record, and they preached Christ. They preached Christ to them. That was their message. Christ was their message. Money was not their message. 
um, healing. The apostles were used to heal, but healing was not their message. Miracles, God used them to do miracles, of course, but that was not their message. The miracles were only uh, an avenue for them to preach the gospel. If you take uh, Peter and John, uh, for example, at the gate called Beautiful, where they laid the, the man that was lame, as soon as that man was healed and they entered into the temple and people came around, you know, for some of us, that would have been the time to advertise the miracle that was done, to advertise themselves, to advertise the power that God released through them. Or perhaps that was the time for them to raise offering, to raise money, seeing that number of people, you know, the large crowd that came. But as soon as they came, you saw Peter deflecting the, 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 the attention from themselves and pointing people back to Christ. He said, why are you looking at us? As if it's by our own uh, holiness, personal holiness and power that this has been done. If you must know, this man has been made whole by the power or in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one you crucified. You see him again, he turned people back to the gospel. How I wish that our lives as Christians, as you go through this day, can you determine that your life will be pointing men to Christ in what you say, in how you say it, in where you go, and all the things that you do point men to Christ. Let me say it again. You have a gospel to preach. But the preaching of the gospel is first and foremost by your life, before your word. In Acts 1.1, 1, 1, uh, uh, Dr. Luke, the evangelist, began to say, uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in the beginning, uh, Theophilus, I wrote unto you of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, I like to say that that is the order in which it must come. Jesus did before he taught. If you're going to preach the gospel, you will leave the gospel first before preaching the gospel. Someone uh, said, what you do speaks so loud, I can't hear what you're saying. Because of course people have to first uh, identify with what you're saying, what you're doing, what your life is, before they're identifying with whatever you have to say. So let's remember again, you have the gospel to preach. And the gospel is not about, it's not money. The gospel is not prosperity necessarily. Prosperity is part of the gospel, but that is not the focus. Prosper, uh, the gospel is not necessarily or lim necessarily limited to miracles. The gospel is the fact that God loved the sinner and came to rescue him. In Christ Jesus, God became man and then lived among us, died for our sins, and then on the third day, he was raised again. And anyone who puts faith in that atoning death becomes a child of God. He is reconciled to God. That is the gospel. Those are a few things I thought to highlight in verse 7. But like I said earlier, I wanted to highlight just two verses to help us meditate and to focus on. So let me highlight one or two things also in verse 10. Verse 10 says, They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. It's interesting to me that when Paul went to meet uh, the pillars of the church, as at that time, people like James, the half-brother of Jesus, people like Peter, people like John, and the rest of them, um, <laughs> the main thing, one of the cardinal things that they reminded Paul about is please remember the poor. You will, I don't know, but the, 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 the remembrance of the poor, identifying with the poor, ministering to the poor, is part, uh, let me say it is the heart of the gospel message. Jesus said, the spirit of God is upon me for he has anointed me to preach. Of course, you see him again making reference to the poor. Now, the early church emphasized it so much. Interestingly, they were asking Apostle Paul, uh, who is the preacher, <laughs> to remember the poor. It was not the 
Paul remembering the preacher. Like many of us will do today. It's the Paul that must remember the preacher. We overemphasized giving. And when, we, when some of our brothers overemphasize, in my opinion, the issue of giving, uh, it's always uh, giving to the preacher. What about the preacher himself giving? But it's interesting for me, very instructive this morning, to note that the pillars of the church reminded Paul, who was the preacher, to always remember the Paul. Of course, I believe they learned it from Jesus. You remember when Jesus was saying to uh, uh, Judas Iscariot that betrayed him, what you want to do or what you intend to do, do quickly. As far as the other apostles were concerned, the disciples were concerned, they thought Jesus was saying, give something to the poor, which meant that it was a regular occurrence. It was something that Jesus practiced and the apostles took over. They also practiced that. You and I, beloved, must also remember the poor. The poor in our community, the poor people around you, the poor people in the, in the school where your child uh, attends and all that you can come across. Truly, uh, anyone who does not know Christ, if you ask me, is truly poor. Genuinely poor. Poverty is not only a matter of uh, not having money. As a matter of fact, I don't believe that um, a man who has money, so much money in his pocket, uh, is the one who is, who is rich, uh, is not poor. Riches go beyond just a physical uh, amount of money. Uh, you can have money and there are things that money cannot buy. There are things that money cannot answer. Money, of course, cannot buy salvation. Of course, there are many things that money cannot buy. But I like to say that anyone who does not know the Lord Jesus as Savior is truly poor. He is truly, truly poor. Poverty. Spiritual poverty. Now, if a man doesn't know Christ, no matter, no matter the amount of money that he has, he is going to go to hell. So what's the essence of his money? Uh, some, some years ago, uh, a doctor, I believe I heard a doctor tell the story. I wasn't there when it happened, so I may not be able to repeat it exactly the way it happened. But uh, the essence of the story was that he was in the hospital, was taking care of a patient, who was a rich man, a very rich man. And then um, he had a terminal case. And he said that on one of the days, he called him and said, doctor, Fly me abroad, anywhere in the world, the best hospitals in the world. I have money. I am rich. I can pay for it. I can take care of it. And I had to say to him, sir, I'm sorry. Even if we take you to anywhere in the world, it's a terminal case and it's advanced. You will still die. What is interesting, according to the story, is that he had the man. He began to abuse his money. For those of you who, uh, you know, understand how, sir. Um, he said, Banza Kawai. And you know, the man was really angry. And he said, look at me, I have so much money and I'm here dying and my money cannot help me. When that brother told the story, when I heard him say, tell that story, it touched me. And you know, I keep remembering it to see that money is very limited. Unfortunately, that's what many of us pursue. And many of us, even as preachers, measure our success by how much money we have. I was in a church, I wasn't told, I was in a church where I heard um, a pastor boasting about how much money that they collect um, every Sunday. He said, you know how much our offering is? Do you know how much our tithe is? Well, I just started this ministry um, such and such a time ago and look at, look at what we collect. And you know, I sat there wondering, as a matter of fact, that man, in my opinion, went too far. Is um, I, I, I wouldn't mention a church, you know, but I was there live. I had gone to visit a brother who lives in that city and he attends that church. So I followed him to church only to hear this kind of preaching that grieved my heart. As a matter of fact, when he finished preaching, when it was time for offering, that man stood up and said, how many of you know that what I have just preached is more than, and he mentioned an amount of money. And he says, so when you're coming for offering, don't come and drop any useless. This message I preach is more than this. I was grieved. 
how can a brother put a price on the priceless sacrifice of Jesus? How much did he buy the anointing that God placed upon him with? When you charge, when you seem to put a charge on the grace of God upon your life, it's an abuse of the gospel. Because you didn't, of course, you didn't anoint yourself. You didn't call yourself. You didn't do anything to merit where you are. I personally believe, for example, that if the preaching of the gospel is by personal qualification, I will never be qualified. It's just grace that brought me. And freely you receive, freely you give. There are some who also insist that they be paid certain amount before they go to preach. All of those things are aberrations from what we see from the word of God. I like to say to you again with every sense of responsibility that you have a gospel to preach and you must remember the poor. The poor is not only those who don't have physical money, but any man that is living under the control of Satan is poor. Any man who is living under the, the domination of sin is poor. Any man who has not heard the gospel, who has not responded to the gospel, is poor. These are the people we must remember. And it's interesting again for me to note that it is the preacher who must remember the poor. And even in physical things, you know, sometimes I see uh, giving to the poor over-dramatized. Once in a year, you're taking some things to the orphanage and you will get television cameras to cover it. <laughs> And you want to be celebrated because during Christmas, for example, you give uh, five bags of rice to one orphanage. What have they been eating from January to December? You need to check. And then many of us have much more than we actually need. But at the heart of the gospel this morning is the remembrance of the poor. At the heart of our meditation this morning is the remembrance uh, of the poor. Let me ask you to take a look at the people around you take a look at the people who are you a student you may be a student and you are in fellowship as a christian maybe you are in fellowship you know uh, the, the campus fellowship and you know a particular brother ever since you knew him two shirts one trouser if it's not this shirt this day is the is the, the other one if he wears this today the other time is the next one and you have shirts that for one week one month you have not won. What are, what are those shirts doing in your wardrobe? <laughs> you need to remember the poor. I remember one, one elderly mama uh, in, in my church once said to me, she struggled to raise the children. And uh, the children graduated and life became a little easier for her. And then um, she could buy you know, many more clothes, changes of clothes. And she said to me, brother, I'm in trouble. I said, what is it? He said, going to church used to be a lot easier for me before. I mean, I just, I just, I had two good dresses to go to church. So I just, when I finish having my bath, I just know this is the one I wore last Sunday. Is this one, this Sunday. Uh, the next Sunday, I go back to the other one. And he said, but now, there are so many, I'll finish having my bath. And for quite a while, I'm standing in front of the wardrobe. And I'm, I'm, I'm debating, what do I wear? What, so what kind of trouble is this? Now, that's a real life story. Now, that may be ridiculous. You know, we, we were laughing over it, you know, and thanking God, of course, for providing, you know, more for her. But it taught me a lesson that sometimes <laughs> life is actually much easier uh, when we don't yield our hearts to the true, to, to the issues of life, to the riches, the physical the riches of life. So as I conclude this morning, I'd like to again summarize by reminding you of two cardinal things that we have said that I'd like for you to meditate upon, pray about it, and seek how to practice it, put it into practice from this morning. Uh, don't wait till tomorrow. Number one, be con convinced beyond reasonable doubt that there is a gospel that has been delivered into your hands. And my friend, that gospel has to be preached. And it is preached first by your life, the way you live, before what you say. Second, you must also remember the poor. 
both the poor physically, those who cannot feed themselves, those who cannot uh, go to school. Uh, there are, there are, if you have more than you, what you need, why don't you consider assisting someone else to pay the school fees of the child, for example, and those who otherwise will never have gone to school. And then, remember, the ones who are truly poor, anyone who has not yielded his life to Christ, anyone who has not heard the message of salvation, deliverance from sin, is truly, truly poor. And I will encourage you this morning to remember them. Let's bow our heads and pray briefly. Father, we are grateful to you that we have an opportunity to look into the perfect law of liberty this morning. We ask, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that by your spirit, you will grip our hearts with the instructions that you have left for us this morning. Help each one of us to know that we have a gospel to preach. And Lord, please help us to know that this gospel is first preached by the way we live, by our lives first, before we can say it. Uh, it was said, I, I've forgotten that early church father that said, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words. That servant of God was pointing us, Lord, to the fact that the way we live preaches the gospel much more than what we say. Lord, we ask of you that you will help us watch our lives in such a way that the way we live our lives, the way we talk, the way we interact with people, we show Christ and that will be more effective than whatever we say. And uh, when people see us, according to your word, Jesus, you said our lives should so shine among men that they, we see our good works and then give glory to you. So that when people see the way we live, they can respond to our Father that is in heaven. Lord, we also ask in the name of Jesus that it will please you, Lord, to make us to remember the poor. Let the compassion that was in the heart of Christ, let it dawn upon us that we will remember the less fortunate around us. We will remember children of the poor around us. And Lord, finally, help us remember those who are genuinely, truly poor, those who don't know Christ, that we might be committed to preaching the gospel unto them. Thank you for hearing, for we have prayed with faith and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We thank you for fellowshipping with us today. We invite you to join us tomorrow morning, same time, same station, for another special edition of the Daily Fountain. If you are led to sponsor or support this program, please contact the numbers and email all showing on your screen. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash ACNNTV. Visit our website www.acnntv.com.